Hello, friends, and welcome to Zionville. A big lesson for us from Israel's idolatry. As you probably know by now, I am going through the Conflict of the Ages series, plus two, Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing and Christ's Object Lessons, as my daily devotions again this year. My reading plan covers all seven books in 365 and 366 days of leap year. This is my second year of doing this systematic study. It has been wonderful. I am learning so much, and I am amazed at how the nation of Israel, which God brought out from Egypt with mighty miracles, can turn to idolatry and apostatize from him throughout most of its entire history. And the Lord brought us forth out of Egypt with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm, and with great terribleness, and with signs and with wonders, Deuteronomy 26 and verse 8. It just seems so impossible given the undeniable proofs they had of his existence, his love, and the help that he gave them constantly. So how did it happen? And why do we have all this accounting of it in the scriptures? Something occurred to me about this when, during a Sabbath morning Bible study, a friend of mine made a comment. I don't remember what he said now, but my mind just snapped to. I realized why. But we'll get to that in a moment. But first, let's survey the situation. Idolatry was a factor among those who would become the chosen people well before the theocracy. Abram came out from an idolatrous people and family in Ur of the Chaldees, thence to Haran and on to Canaan. Others who left brought their idols with them. Virtually everybody on earth was an idol worshiper back then, which is why God had to carefully survey the people to find his man, whose name was changed to Abraham. But the theocracy was still future, and this important step was marred at its start. Israel's life as a theocratic nation under God began at Mount Sinai in Arabia, and idolatry began with the theocracy in that very unlikely place, the place where Jehovah gave his people his law. That's right, I'm talking about the apostasy with the golden calf. It was a representation of the Egyptian god Apis, the bull, God had just given the Ten Commandments, the second of which says this, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Exodus 20, verses 4 to 6. And now you know where Jesus got that phrase, if you love me, keep my commandments. He got it from the second commandment. He wants us to avoid all idolatry. And right then, at the mountain, they broke it, right there at Sinai, especially heinous because of the juxtaposition of the second commandment with the first. But more on that point at the end. Moses came down the mountain after receiving the tablets from God and found an orgy in progress. His brother Aaron, the high priest, had yielded to the demands of the people who had just heard God's law, remember, and made them a god to worship, a golden calf made from their own gold jewelry. They were dancing and fornicating all around it, right at Sinai. This just serves to show us how important the law is in that Satan could get up this sickening display immediately after it was given. His purpose was to get the people to quickly forget it and blaspheme it by breaking it. Satan hates the law of God, friends, and unfortunately he is still getting people to blaspheme it, break it, and forget it, even in God's one true God Advent movement. Yes, sadly, there are teachers who minimize the law of God and teach the people not to be too concerned with it. Some say the book of James doesn't belong in the Bible. He was very concerned with it. And they also encourage the Advent believers against Sister White's counsels as well. well. She speaks about the law all the time. So this is very dangerous. Be aware, friends, be aware. Don't just believe every preacher because he understands the Father and the Son teaching correctly. Satan is even hiding behind this now. And so, after after the rebellion at Mount Sinai, we have a continuing trail of idolatry. When, 40 years later, the covenant people finally entered Canaan, they found themselves fighting the pagan peoples who lived there. 
and during that time they were very influenced by them. Once the Israelites cleared the land with the constant help of the Most High, many of these peoples were still settled around the land of Israel. More contact and more influence generation after generation as many rank-and-file Israelites started adopting their customs and their gods. Intermarriage and Sabbath-breaking occurred because of the pagan principles that they learned, and thus were also big problems in the baleful trial of idolatry that the people trod. As to leadership, we can only mention a few examples, but believe me, there are many more. There was Jeroboam, who again brought the worship of a golden calf back to Israel, even saying, Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. 1 Kings 12 and verse 28. Unbelievable! This time the calf represented the contemporary Canaanite god Baal. Today, archaeologists have found the foundation of his pagan altar at Dan pictured here. The aluminum frame represents the altar with its four horns, and the calf was on a pillar behind that. Saul and Solomon practiced idolatry. Samson was done in by Delilah and her wicked accomplices, worshippers of Dagon, and most of the rulers of the divided kingdom were idolaters. They were bad kings. The mind boggles, at least mine does. Reading through those portions of scripture in the spirit of prophecy, it seems to never end. It is a constant thing. Didn't they ever learn? Then, of course, there was Ahab and Jezebel. <clears throat> he married this pagan princess, and things were never the same. She forced her gods on her husband and the whole populace. Elijah was her constant threat as he brought the word of the Lord to the court. She hated him. He appeared in the court and denounced their sins, and in return she pursued him all over the country to kill him. But Jehovah kept his faithful prophets safe. This is emblematic of his protection of the one true God Advent remnant at the end, who will finally be raptured to heaven just as Elijah was at the second coming of Christ, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16-18. We must stand against the papacy, that's the modern-day Jezebel, and its false doctrines wherever found in Catholicism, in Orthodoxy, in Protestantism, and in modern Seventh-day Adventism. The whole is now leavened, as Jesus said it would be, by the papacy, the modern Jezebel, as I've said, and her work, and its work. Heaven, leaven, rather, represents sin in this context. Another parable spake he unto them, The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal, till the whole was leaven, Matthew 13 and verse 33. Eventually, the wicked queen met her end with all of Ahab's house when she was pushed out the palace window, fell to her death, and was eaten by dogs. Her whole career is, com is a compacted prophecy of the Roman Catholic papacy, even to the point of the dogs, as seen in Mark 7, 26-28, a, a symbol of the Gentile pagans in Scripture, the papacy's very people. And indeed, the book of Revelation says, that the Gentiles she deceived about religion shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire, Revelation 17, 16, when great Babylon comes in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath, Revelation 16, 19. End time Jezebel will go, just as did the original, destroyed by dogs. Her cup of wine is her false doctrines. God's cup is his wrath. Now, what about the why of all this accounting? Why are we confronted with Israel's idol worship constantly in the divine records? Wouldn't one or two references have been enough? First, we have to understand what the Apostle Paul said about this. Now, all these things happened unto them for ensamples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth Take heed lest he fall. 1 Corinthians 10, verses 11 and 12. So these accounts, one after another, indeed are written for us at the end of time. And what clicked in my mind during that Bible study was the need for earthlings today to know the one true God, the only true God, the Most High Jehovah, our Father. 
Christendom has left him in the dust. He's there, and that's about it. It is about as far as they go. But there is so much more. This is the reason no one seems to talk about, particularly needful for the present population of planet Earth upon whom the ends of the world are come, as I've said. And particularly Adventists need to heed these scriptural warnings to begin with, out of which will come the 144,000 preaching the loud cry message of Revelation 18, 1 to 5. The Lord will not have those do this who deny him by substituting the Trinity or the tritheistic God family or any other false God. It is true, my friends, we must speak the truth in all things. Those who won't will fall away eventually as things get tougher and tougher and be no part of God's reconciling ministry in those days. If you believe any of those substitutes because the church tells you they are right, you are risking heaven right now. Please think about this. We have to be thoroughly biblical on salvational issues. And Jesus says, this is salvational. Just look at the first five words of John 17, 3. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. John 17 and verse 3. This is not a sidetrack, side but rather the very foundation upon which everything concerning our salvation is built upon. Yes, the whole Bible, spirit of prophecy, and everything in them is built on the one true God. Today, virtually the whole planet is out of touch with the one true God. There are Hindus, Buddhists, Muslims, Animists, Baha'i, Zoroastrians, and on and on, groups and religions far too numerous to mention, and particularly Christians who do not know the Most High God, the Father, as the one true God of the Bible. These Christians think that the false God, the Trinity, is the one true God. That doesn't even exist. Nor is Jesus the one true God, but rather he is the son of the one true God, the Most High, a real son, not a metaphorical son playing a role as the so-called theologians of today teach. And this even exists now in modern nominal Adventism. The Father isn't known by most of the peoples of the world either, not as the Bible teaches him, as the Father of the Redeemer. Muslims and Jews particularly are wrong on this important issue. People in these straits are thus cut off from heaven and its blessings and will not have eternal life should they die in their present condition fighting the Father. This is serious. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. 2 John chapter 1 and verse 9. The biblical doctrine of both the Father and the Son is all important. This is not about Christ's doctrines, but about the doctrine of Christ. He is a real Son, not a metaphor. To miss that he is a real Son, the only begotten of the Father before all creation, Proverbs 8, 22 to 26, and to sideline the Father for the Trinity is to abide not in the doctrine of Christ. The teachings throughout the Bible make Jesus' position in God's hierarchy very clear. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 3. Yes, it all starts with God the Father, the source of all. Thus Jesus prayed to his Father in this manner, once again repeating John 17:3. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. John 17 and verse 3. Once again, because it is so important that you really know this, this means that the Father, the Father alone, is the Most High God of the Bible and none other. Jesus is his real divine Son, full deity as well by virtue of inheriting everything from his Father, Hebrews 1 verses 1 to 9. Not by age, for Jesus had a beginning before all creation, Proverbs 8, 22 to 26, begotten, not made, nor created. Like begets like, Genesis 1. So one divine being can only beget another divine being. Jesus is not a lesser God. And hence, 
They are, really, the Father and the Son. He has not existed for all eternity, all of eternity past, but was brought forth from the Father in eternity past. Proverbs 8.25, John 16.28, before anything was created by them. Proverbs 8.27-31 and Ephesians 3.9. And the Apostle Paul clearly defines the one God for us. But to us, there is one God, the Father, not the Trinity, one God, the Father, of whom are all things and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him, 1 Corinthians 8, 6. They are clearly two separate beings, as he, sa- and as he says that the Father is the Most High God, not Jesus. And there can only be one of them, friends, one Most High. Jesus is the Son, and a real Son, which co-eternal explicitly denies. It's a shame that the modern Seventh-day Adventist Church has gone this route officially since 1980. And do not fear, Jesus is still full deity because of who his Father is. That's important, and is how he can have a beginning and still be full deity. The Father even even calls him God. Again, read Hebrews 1, verses 1 to 9. Above, we mentioned that the second commandment, forbidding idols, came right after the first, which it is in juxtaposition with. They go closely together, in other words. Here it is. I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Exodus 20, verses 2 and 3. The Jews took this so seriously, as we should also, but most of them missed the fact that God had a son, Proverbs 30, verse 4, who would be our Savior, the Son of God, John 3:16. This singular God, our Father, says, have no other gods before his face. The Israelites had many throughout their career as his witnessing people, which they failed miserably at. They were supposed to teach the nations, but they betrayed their trust and mission. It struck me that this is why their, their idolatry is constantly presented to us in Scripture, so that we not do the same at the end of the world as Paul has warned us. In other words, the Father is thus constantly contrasted to the Israelites with the idols of the nations as the one true God, the Most High, the source of all. This must never be forgotten. They did, and many of them paid the price. But Christendom has also forgotten the contrast, including modern Adventism. By its false doctrines of God, the contrast is made of none effect. So the next time you read about God's anger against Old Testament Israel over their idols, remember, it's coming home to us next. And make your move out of Babylon to your heavenly Father through his only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one mediator between God and man, 1 Timothy 2 and verse 5. Best thing you'll ever do. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me, John 14, 6. So keep the contrast in mind always and worship with biblical intelligence, no matter what some person or church or creed tells you. Jesus is coming soon. Maranatha.